Hello everyone, my name is Megan Gross and I'm a first year master's student at the School for Environment Sustainability. I'm also your GSI, so you probably know who I am by now. Um, and I study environmental justice and agroecology in Dr. Yvette Perfecto's lab, which is shared with, among many, many things, with the person who I'm going to introduce for you today, Dr. John Vandermeer. John is a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. He studies the complex relationships in coffee agroecosystems, um, ecological relationships, in both Puerto Rico and Mexico, among other places. And if you've ever met him, you'll know that he's an incredibly lively and passionate speaker, so you're about to hear a really exciting and probably very loud, <laughs> <laughs> which is great because this is going to be super important. Right now, his favorite food is sancocho. So here's John. Thank you. Uh, I have a lapel mic on. Am I, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, where's my clip? The arrow on the keyboard. Yeah. What is it? Just use the keyboard, keyboard arrow. I don't see a keyboard. Down. Down. Oh. All right. So, I'll try to be as loud as I can. Uh, I come to you to speak of Puerto Rico, which has a C5 designation coffee, capitalism, colonialism, and Coca-Cola. You may recall that the Europeans took some time to invent an ideology, including the various dichotomies suggested here. When the Spanish brought that ideology, they called it civilization. They brought with them guns, germs, rape, and other things. Agriculture quickly became an economic backbone with two particular commodities, uh, sugarcane and coffee. As the U.S. sought to become an empire, tropical islands looked like fair game for someone entering the contest pretty late. Pretty, pretty late. But World War II kind of intervened with the empire, and the world suddenly became thinking that decolonization was a good thing. And from Iraq and Jordan to Lebanon and Syria to Palestine, sort of, and despite colonization exceptional, exceptionalists like Portugal and Belgium and settler societies like South Africa and Kenya, decolonization proceeded pretty quickly, as you can see in this color-coded map of Asia and Africa, almost all of which were European colonies. And today, decolonization is more than just a fact of history. It has become a metaphor for something quite, quite a bit deeper, as these students from Oxford protested, protested in 2015. Even science itself has become, has been challenging to challenge to examine its deep colonial roots by the international organization Science for the People. Yet there are places where the real decolonization movement, where the real decolonization movement seems to have skipped. The United Nations has repeatedly mandated the United States to leave Puerto Rico to decolonize. And uh, since the U.S. is a proud defender of international law, the U.S. immediately left Puerto Rico after the mandate. Uh, not exactly. To this day, the United States is in violation of international law, which you are allowed to do if you have big enough guns or bombs. Back to the subject of coffee. <laughs> it arrives in Puerto Rico in 1736 and is cultivated by thousands of small-scale farmers. Produced in Puerto Rico, it becomes a source of pride for the country, and one frequently hears Puerto Ricans proclaim that it is a coffee that is drunk at the, Va at the Vatican. From the beginning, coffee has had, its had, has had its contradictory meanings. On the one hand, as a symbol of empire, but also as a major backbone of the small-scale producer in the mountains of Puerto Rico. A crucial connection exists, uh, exists with the issue of food most of which comes from, Puerto, from not Puerto Rico. Crops that are in fact grown in abundance on the island, many of which grow on coffee farms, are not available on supermarket shelves. Yaltia from the Dominican Republic, for example, bananas from Ecuador, grapefruit from Costa Rica are all you can find in supermarket shelves, while those same crops on Puerto Rican farms are left to rot in the field. There is, inspirationally, a new farmer movement in Puerto Rico. The gentleman on the left, left, gentleman on the left, is a, a good friend, Eduardo, uh, Edgardo Alvarado, a coffee farmer who is also son of, on the right, on the right. <laughs> the gentleman on the right, a good friend, Ed, uh, Edgardo Alvarado, a coffee farmer who is also uh, the sort of a guru of the new farmer movement. He has been promoting organic agriculture on the island for many years and was one of the founders of the national organic movement known as Boricua. 
And the farmer on the left is from the farm known as the Consciousness Farm on the island of Yekis. The Josco Bravo Agricultural School trains new farmers in agroecological techniques and has passed over 300 students through its courses in the past few years. While the movement for young farmers to reinvigorate the agricultural sector of Puerto Rico is large and growing, there is a subtle but real avoidance of coffee as an opportunity. These contradictions are real, <coughs> but there are also some practicalities involved, especially for new and not rich farmers, effectively on the economic edge. But another entity appreciates the power, uh, the potential of coffee in Puerto Rico. The Coca-Cola Company started their own subsidiary called the Puerto Rican Coffee Roasters Company and bought up all the classical brands of Puerto Rican coffee. If nothing is done soon, the entire coffee system of Puerto Rico will be under the control of Coca-Cola. Brian Simon wrote this marvelous book, Everything But the Coffee, talking about Starbucks' rise, rise to prominence. As the title suggests, coffee as a product is only a very small part of their business model. It's more about style, appearance, the idea that carting around a cup of overpriced coffee makes you a very, very cool person. This other book by Lindsay Naylor has a similar message, but on the progressive side. The Zapatistas see in fair trade coffee a political mo uh, movement, a way of inserting themselves in the larger political struggles of the day. So, is this black gold of Puerto Rico <clears throat> to be a trinket for the new imperialists, or can it become a tool in the struggle for a free Puerto Rico? And remember Edgardo's farm. He produces, yes, coffee, but also, but also all of those things. <clears throat> and also trees. <laughs> As a final note, let me advertise a new movement that our group is intimately involved with. The Institute for Agroecology is purchasing this core of coffee farm, the Grand Bate Farm, with the idea to transform it into a diversified farming system with coffee as an economic backbone and extensive food production agroecology style as a piece of the larger puzzle of wresting control of Puerto Rico's black gold from the new imperialists and set the stage for solving the food crisis that exists in the country today. You may join us if you wish. Thank you. <laughs>